This is Duke University. So some of you may know that I'm Professor Lewin, and I'm going to introduce our speaker for this session. Uh, my guess is that I'm introducing our speaker because at Duke we've had a project that's has been studying this phenomenon that the speaker's going to talk about since the year 2004. So we've been, we're we'll probably going to be the uh, most well-known recognized academic center for studying the phenomenon. Just to put something in perspective for you, we're talking about a, an activity where companies are accomplishing their tasks and processes in relationships with partner organizations like our guest speaker today, who's come from Bitcoin. Just to give you an idea, between 2004 and last year, this industry represents three and a half trillion dollars in revenue. According to Gartner's estimates, our own estimates at Duke are about one billion. The speaker says that their their calculations are two point nine trillion. Two point nine trillion. Yeah. So uh, we are in the one trillion to three and a half trillion range. Uh, we have a database of eight hundred over eight hundred providers, like the company that is represented here today, uh, which put, together employ over three million. Employees. So you give us some idea about the phenomenon that we are going to hear about today. And uh, I should say we have a long history with our, with our guest company, Bitro, that sponsored one of the early conferences that we did on the subject, uh, you know, I think about that in 2006 or 2007. It's a particular pleasure to introduce our speaker because, among other things, he is a Fuqua graduate from the Cross Continent program in the year 2005. And he reminded me that 2005 was what, the second or third year of the program. And I did not remember it having any this. He seems to remember that I thought the strategy was. So. <laughs> I think that's a good thing, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, that's what I'd like to do is just introduce our speaker, Mr. Kwok Nguyen from Abitra. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. I think I. I, I, I do I need to do anything special with it? I'm good. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, 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 first of all, I was, I'll say this: this, this is, has been a humbling experience for me to um, be up here, and I, I remember in 2003, starting with the cross counter uh, MBA pro program, and I was sitting there and I go, there's no way I, I could make that work. I mean, they just the, the, the academic pressure and just the amount of work that you guys are going through, and I just remember what I went through. And so it's, um, for me, if nothing else, it's been a, a humbling journey just to be where I am. And, and I just want to you know, share that with you guys, that it's, it's, it, it humbles me that, that you guys are sitting in these positions. And I hope that within the next five, 10 years, um, you guys can take the, the little piece of work that, that we're doing and, and you know, exceed that, right? So um, with that said, um, I want to go ahead and, and start. How many people in this room, first of all, are familiar with the concept of shared services? OK, so we, we, we have a, 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 a um, uh, a, a good opportunity to talk about that. So basically what I want to do, and, and I'm sorry, how do I flip the, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, cool, thanks professor. He's still teaching me, by the way, so. <laughs> um, so so um, what, what I want to do for the, for the balance of the, the presentation is walk you guys through and share with you guys a little bit about shared services. What is, you know, basically the level set, right? We're gonna talk about, you know, um, how, when people talk about shared services, what do they mean, right? When people talk about outsourcing, what do they mean, right? Because the, the reality is that the, the terminology and the concept and the principle and everything is like that is out there, but oftentimes they've been misused. And I just wanna spend a little bit of time level setting what that is, right? Um, the, the, the second point that I want to talk about is, you know, so now that you use, you know what share services is, 
why, why is it important? What, what is the business case? Why should companies be interested in this model, right? Um, I mean, what's the value there? Is it just basically, you know, putting lipstick on a pig, right? Or, or do you do something more significant than that, right? And then the third piece of this kind of level setting part is basically to introduce you to a concept that I am very passionate about called global business services. This is something that the professor and I share in common, and so I really appreciate that. And then <clears throat> after that, we're going to talk a little bit about Asia's role in shared services, right? And, and what is the market potential in, in the Asian market? Um, and then, you know, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the implication. So you got it. You understand market size. What does this mean, right? And how do we leverage it? How do we move forward from it? And then I'll, I'll spend a little bit, a few minutes talking a little bit more about Wipro. Um, so in, if you guys were in the uh, presentation previously with David Taylor, I think what's interesting was that uh, P, uh, Procter & Gamble started from North America and moved to Asia, right? Wipro, on the other hand, we're an Indian company, so we started in Asia. And now 80% of our customers are US-based. So, so we're, we're kind of doing the, the, the opposite of that. So there have been you know, uh, painful lessons that we learned as an organization moving westward. So I uh, want to share that with you guys as well. Any questions at all? So, so the way I, I like to do this is if you guys have questions, let's have a dialogue. I don't want, you know, I don't want to, can you wait until the last five minutes of the conversation or whatever? Let's talk through this because the more informed you guys are, are and the more engaged you are, the better it is for all of us. Okay. Share services definition. Okay. Um, basically, and, and I, I don't want to read through that, but basically, what I want to do is to basically say this. Okay, a share services organization is basically a a corporate function that a business or legal entity has decided to consolidate and build. So what I mean by that is this, right? If you are a company like Procter & Gamble, you have a number of business units. Every single business units have their own finance and accounting team. They all have their own HR, they all have procurement, supply chain, et cetera, right? And if you think about from a global market um, competition landscape perspective, that's a very inefficient way to run the business because you're carrying overheads across all of your business units. So the concept of shared services is, is let's build an organization and take all of these what we call typically back office functions and put them in the, the, these organization. And then from that, we service the business units um, as if they were individual customers. Make sense so far? OK. So this is very easy. So for example, if, I, if I'm in accounting, I work for the shared services organization at Procter & Gamble, but I provide accounting services to every single brand that exists within the P&G um, framework. Yes. Same thing with HR, same thing with supply chain. Um, and I'll give you an example of the, of the power of this, right? For a company like Procter & Gamble, um, they're not a customer of mine, but my, one of my uh, best customers is also a competitor with Procter & Gamble. Uh, by the name of Rekha Ben Kieser. Okay, Rekha Ben Kieser, you don't know who they are, but they make products like Lysol and, and stuff like that. Um, for them, if you know, they have a bunch of business units that are you know, $800 million, $900 million, $1.2 billion, $500 million, right? So when they go through and they used to negotiate buying power, office supply, you name it, computers, right? Lenovo, it doesn't matter, right? Um, they have, you know, typically on the average about you know, 10, 12 percent savings, right? If they're able to consolidate the whole entity, right, now all of a sudden you're talking about a $60 billion um, organization that can leverage the buying power. So share services allows you to do that. It allows you to negotiate contract corporate-wise from a global perspective to reduce costs. Right, and that's that's really is what the play of shared services is. Okay, um, some key design principle. I, 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 you know, and this is something that I've learned in my career. And by the way, I started this whole process with shared services because um, a number of years ago, I actually was the corporate controller of, of a company called NetIQ, and I ran the finance and accounting department. 
and was really frustrated with, with how we do things. I mean, I, if I needed to talk to another group, uh, I had to go through the very official channel of getting financial statements and looking at how they audit their books. And so I made a, uh, a, a proposal to the CEO of the company, let me consolidate everything under one roof. And so once we were able to do that, we effectively reduced our cost in finance and accounting by about 60%. Okay? In addition to that, we had a lot more transparency, and we had a less uh, reduced our cost of auditing by almost $20 million. And that didn't sound like a big deal, but we're talking about a $2 billion company, so everything that we could say was significant for the company. So that was my, my journey into, into share services. After I was able to do that, then it became, OK, I, can, I like this stuff, right? Could I do this more on a global scale? Right? Could I do something much bigger than a $1 billion company? Joint consulting and had a chance to work with companies like Cisco, Microsoft, um, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, you name it. Right? And, and again, it, it allows me to, in, in my words, just fine tune and, and my craft. Right? And, and that's where I learned how to become more efficient and more um, effective in this role. Okay. One thing that I've learned in, in this whole process is that regardless of what you do with the, this organization, you need to run it like a business, right? Um, you have corporate charter. You need to figure out a way to measure how effective you are, right? You need to figure a way to, to serve your customers, right? And, and I will tell you this. Uh, regardless of what industry that you, you guys decide to pursue, always be customer-centric whether you, you're taking on a role that allow you to serve internally for an organization, or whether you're working for a consumer product company like Procter & Gamble. Focus on the customer. Focus on the customer. Focus on the customer. And if you're able to do that, and you can then look at how the customer would want you to interact with them, right? And so you develop metrics, reports, charging mechanism, communication, you develop all of these tools that allow you to become more efficient to the customer. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Oftentimes when I hear the concept of uh, share services and I hear people talk about it, they go, okay, it's, yeah, this is, you're basically just centralizing your back office. You take every business unit together and you kind of pull their back office and then you centralize it. The, the reality is share service is not about that, right? And, and, and the reason why share services is not about that is because we are trying to build an infrastructure that allows a company to be, compete um, in its marketplace. So for example, when I was with NetIQ, we were a software company, okay? We're, you know, and, and we competed against you know, a bunch of companies like BMC Software, um, Attachmate, et cetera, right? Having the ability to build a shared services organization allows us to put more resources and focus as an organization to do what is important for us, which is build software, right? And then we can do, and we can be more efficient in the back end of it. We can allow the executive and middle management to focus the rest of the organization forward, right? And that's the really important key about shared services. That, that's something I want you to take away from, okay? Okay. The other thing that, that you know, I'll say about shared services, and we can move on to that, is that you know, in, in any kind of business arrangement, we have contracts, right? So if you're buying something from me, um, there's a contract that says, Here's, here are the terms and conditions that you would accept the services by, and here's how I would charge you. Okay? Shared services organization, that is the, exactly the model that we use, right? If, if I'm going to provide you an accounting report or an HR report, how fast and how efficient am I providing that to you, right? Additionally, if I am to manage all, your, all of your strategic sourcing activities, the buying activities, what is the benefit that I'm delivering back to the organization, okay? I'm gonna charge you X number of dollars. In return, I commit to delivering, you know, X number of dollars in savings, right? And not only that, I can commit to having your supply chain um, system optimized, and so that when you need inventory, you need raw material, or goods, whatever it is, 
you can get them in just in time instead of having me stockpiling it or you have a delay in supply chain. So shared services, again, is, is a business function. It's a lot more comprehensive than just taking all of the you know, back office function and centralizing it. Any questions so far? OK. Okay. So, so when, we, when we talked about shared services initially, um, the, the, co the concept was created around IT as well as finance and accounting. And the reason is because if you look back and you look at, at um, most organizations, they spend a lot of money on IT investment. I mean, every single year when I was in corporate finance at you know, the third quarter of the year, the CIO and his staff would come up and they would give you this crazy budget about what they need from an IT investment, right? And us, uh, the, the people in finance, we become the no people, right? <laughs> you want this? No. You know, you want $200 million for this? No, right? And, but, but you realize after a while that, that you know, uh, that's not really the way to service the business. They want it because, you know, there's, there's a business reason and justification for it. And so you, you manage it, but, but at the same time, and you guys notice something, right? In 1980s, if you bought a computer, okay, uh, back then it was a, uh, an Apple IIe or, or an XT or whatever it is, that, that computer will last you five, six years. Okay? The product development cycle was that long. Right? Nowadays, you bought a computer and next year is outdated. Right? So what happens? What, what, what happened basically is that the cost that IT organization as a whole has incurred has gone up significantly, and it, it's continually climbing. As a result of that, the shared services model was created originally to support IT organization, right? If I have an IT function across you know, 25 business units, if I consolidate it and I create the shared services model for it, I can typically reduce that cost by about 40 to 60 percent from an, an, uh, from an OpEx perspective. Okay, so that's kind of the, the gist of it. But what had happened to, from that point to where it is now is that literally every corporate function that we've seen has some flavor of it in shared services, right? So you started with IT, you went to finance and accounting, you went to supply chain, you went to HR, right? And now you do marketing, right? You have analytics, right? And then you do product development. I, I, I sh shared with the professor this morning that one of the things that we do at Wipro, um, and you guys don't, um, how many of you guys own one or, or have um, some, or own a BMW or, or know somebody who has one, right? Well, the reality is the instrument cluster in the BMW was actually designed and engineered by Wipro, right? Um, now, if you don't like the color, that's, <laughs> I can't pick it on that. But the reality is that we have evolved the shared services model from just doing transactional work in the past 20 years to now where we're doing a lot of things like design uh, and engineering services, right? Um, Microsoft, everybody uses Microsoft, right? 20% of the codes in Microsoft are developed by Wipro from a shared services perspective. Texas Instrument, um, Texas Instrument uh, completely leveraged Wipro for all uh, R&D function. As a matter of fact, we as an organization ha have invested in over uh, 2,500 PhD, full-time PhD. And that's all their job is just do research and development. So my point here is that, you know, as an organization, as a market, shared services started out very simple. IT, move to finance. Now we're moving to very strategic categories like product development, product design, customer segmentation. So the opportunity is huge. Professor and I were uh, kind of debating this morning. I mean, the reality is, you know, is the market one trillion or three trillion? You know, um, my, my point is it doesn't really matter. I'm just saying that's a significant market, right? And what that market lacks as a whole is talent, people that would actually go in there and figure out how to build a better mousetrap. And, and that's kind of why I'm there, right, and, uh, and why you know, there's an opportunity for you guys to look at that as a, a, a way to, you know, develop your, invest your career. That's an awesome um, area to invest in. 
right? Okay. Um, trends in search share services, I think I shared this a little bit with you guys already, right? The biggest trend is just the scope, we just expanded, right? We, we, we're no longer just talking about the back office function, we're talking about middle offices, right? Middle office for us is, is things like analytics, right? Um, and when I started my uh, career a number of years ago, I, was, uh, I started it in, in CRM, all right? And, and my biggest customer at that time was a company, a little company by the name of Best Buy. And, and, and at that time, it was actually a little company, and they were actually struggling. And so when we went through and we look at analytics, um, one of the things that we came up with with Best Buy, um, and we still use it to this day, is that if, I don't know if you guys seen a Best Buy advertisement lately, right? Um, but at that time, when, when Best Buy put on an advertisement, we actually didn't want you to buy anything in that advertisement. It sounds weird, right? I mean, we, we, how do you put out, you spend millions of dollars on a weekly basis and you don't want the customer to buy anything in the, in the advertisement. The reality was that we wanted people to look at the advertisement, show up at the store, and buy the product to the left or to the right of that product, okay? And the reason is because those products to the left or the right, they may cost five or $10 more. The margin for the company is about 40, 50% more. Right? Again, analytics. And so what I'm saying is right now, share services, we're incorporating that into how we deliver services through the organization as well. Tell me about who my customers are, right? Um, when, when, you know, the other thing that we're doing right now is we're doing something called predictive analytics, right? So if I can look at a particular zip code, and I can look at it and go, you know what, if I was to open up a diaper store, and this is a number of years ago when Babies R Us was actually popular, um, what is the lifetime value of a customer that lives in this particular zip code? You know, when, when before uh, this customer has, you know, have all of their kids grown up, how much money would they have spent buying diapers? Okay. And then what would I do as an organization to maximize my wallet share? Meaning that if, if they're going to spend $100,000 during that lifetime on diapers, I want $95,000 of it. Right, so what do I do with that? So again, share services, this whole concept is broadening. Right? We allow, uh, have a lot more services, and now we do something what I call integrating services. So what I mean with that is this. So in the, in the past, when we talked about finance, accounting, and IT, and supply chain, we typically talked about them in the concept of, of you know, silo organization, right? You do something in finance, you do something in HR, you do something in IT, right? Nowadays, the approach that we take to our customers is order the cash, right? When an, a customer places an order to you actually collecting and applying the cash in your financial system, what are all of the activities that take place, right? And how do you manage that from a shared services perspective? Procure to pay. When you decide that you want to, to buy something, whether it's raw material or, or goods for your offices or whatever it is, right? Think about it from the, the concept of strategy, PO, creating a PO, PO for requisition, buying the product or services, paying for it, receiving it, and then accounting for it. Right? So now we're looking at value chain. So that's, that's where shared services as a whole is moving towards as well. And, and to be honest with you, and the professor and I talked about this, a lot of companies are not really good at this. Right? Internally, we as an, an organization, um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to be better in this area as well. And that's why I think that one of the things that, that for us to be you know, continually developing this market, we need talent. We need people who are passionate about customer service, dealing, even though the customer is internal, right? Um, something that I, 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 you know, that, that you know, I want to talk about as well is the concept of shared services has been um, often uh, included in the outsourcing discussion. And while that is true for a majority uh, of, of the trends in the past, what I'm seeing now today is that uh, there are companies that, that realize that, you know what, we offshore, we outsource a lot of our function. We realize that, that our customer wanted be something better, and then so we shift, we're onshoring it back again, right? I, I'll give you an example. I'm an American Express holder, okay? I have um, 
three American Express card. I have a corporate card, right? That, that I use that for traveling for business, right? And then I have a regular Amex card, okay? And then I have my platinum Amex card, okay? When I call my regular Amex customer service, I get somebody in India. Half the time, I have no idea what they say, right? We're struggling with language. They speak English. I speak English. I, I have no idea what happens, right? But we just have a hard time communicating, right? I call my platinum card customer service. It's done in Indiana, right? So I think you know what. What my point to you guys is that you know, share service is more than just outsourcing. Share service is figuring ways to leverage mass capability to drive your business from a competitive perspective. Okay? So think of it more than just that. Okay? When you speak about stuff like that and, and, and stuff we you spoke about earlier, such as like uh, more on the, I guess, creative, like the opposite of sort of the offshore processing type model, how does that change your interactions with your, with your customers? I, mean, I, I would imagine it's a very different relationship when you're designing a console or doing R&D for them versus processing payments or just doing you know, a call center is what some people think about in terms of things like that. I'm not sure I understand the, the question. Are you saying that, are you asking the question of how do I interact with my customer? Well, because how does that interaction change? I was thinking specifically in terms of how you sort of get, get paid or, or things like oh, that okay. when, you talk to, when you talk to, when you have just such very different things you're processing on behalf of your, uh, your customers. Right, right, right. So remember, when, when you are a shared services organization, your customers are typically internal, right? M meaning that you are providing not, uh, you're prov if, I'm, if I'm a shared services organization for GE, my customers are, are other GE business units. They're not external. They're not like the GE end user, right? So, so in, in, I mean, does that make sense? Well, yes, if you're contracted with BMW to design okay. Uh, uh, like Wipro is contracted mm -hmm. to BMW to design a panel, mm -hmm. but you're also contracted to some other company to do other things, I would assume, as well. Right. Like what you're uh -huh. That seems like it's very, very different. Right. Yeah, I mean, for us, you set up team, right? I mean, uh, you know, we have the, our BMW account. We have our um, Xerox account that, for them, all we do is finance and accounting invoice processing, right? And we have another team that does just nothing but marketing um, share services capability. So, so you do have a segmentation in your own internal organization and how you service the customer. Does that, does that answer that? And so, and so what I'm saying is that and, and, and how you interact with your customer is completely dependent on what the relationship is, right? So for example, if, 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 if the customer wants me to drive down the cost to produce, uh, to, to process an invoice, right? And right now, they're it costing them 25 cents uh, per to produce an invoice. They may come to me and say, "Hey, Quo, you need to bring this down to eight cents an invoice, right? We don't care about anything else. We just reduce the cost right now, right? Then my relationship and how I design the structure and the account relationship is very different with that customer versus a customer like BMW that said, "You know what? In addition, we don't want you to do that part." We have a product that's going to go into our 7 series, okay? And what we want you to do is tell us what is the best way and the most affordable way to build that product and engineer that product, okay? So I don't want you to cut costs necessarily if you compromise everything else because, again, it's a premium brand. They don't, I mean, the cost, we're paying for the cost, right, if you drive one. So their focus is a little bit different, and so how we structure ourselves as an organization to serve a company like BMW is completely different than how we structure ourselves to service a company that where we're just drive invoices, can we get out the fastest possible? I mean, does, does that make sense? I mean, so you, you, it's like what you guys do here. You create work team, work groups, and then you service that. Any other question? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so you mentioned about the different kind of offshore processing with the India versus Indiana. So with the places and locations that you could have globally, do you tier all that? Um, Potentially, like if you say outsourced a an administrative office uh, function to Canada versus India, that's being uh, so that's being priced differently, correct? 
Uh, yeah, so you're talking about labor arbitrage, right? So, so, so basically this, right? And, and I think you saw some um, graph in, in that room, right? Basically this, if people who live in, um, what is 60% of the world, uh, the, of the country, the population in Asia, makes less than $2,000 a year, right? So just, just do the math on that, right? The literacy rates in, in, in Asia, it varies from country to country, but they're, they're hovering around the high 80s to mid 90, okay? The population demographic, you know, mostly in the, you know, it, it's probably about 70% of the population, is the, the band is around 25 to 34. Okay, so what does that tell me, right? India alone produce over 800,000 uh, graduate a year, right? And they all need jobs. And if, if, if they're making, you know, five, six thousand dollars a year, whereas the job here costs, you know, sixty thousand dollars a year, the, the economics makes sense for that. But at the same time, I would say this, okay, there are companies in India that are outsourcing to the U.S. as well. Okay, so what I mean by that, so Wipro, for example, all of our sales functions are done in the U.S. Why? Because most of our customers are in the U.S. So, so yeah, you can, do a, you, can, you can lower your cost of your sales uh, team if you have them in Asia. You probably won't get any customer, though. I mean, does that, does, does that make sense? I mean, does that answer your question? Sort of. Um, I was wondering about um, how Wipro kind of manages like a, a pricing strategy based on things like proximity, things like maybe specialized services. Okay. Yeah. Typically. So yeah. No. No. Yeah. Okay. My my apology. It, it, it for us it's basically is the, depending on where the service is, is going to be performed. So I know how much it costs me to have an, a person in, in in China. I know how much it costs to have me to have a person in Manila. Right. I know how much it costs to have a, pr a person in Curitiba in Brazil. I know how much it costs to have a, a person in, in Timisoara, Romania. Right. So if, if your strategy, if you or as an organization wants to have an Eastern European presence, I won't propose China and India and all of that. We focus on what's in, what we have in, in, in um, Eastern Europe. Right. And then if, I, if you accept that proposal, um, then the pricing will be reflective of that. And, and a lot of times a, a, a company decides on how to, you know, like, should I outsource, uh, you know, outsource to India or whatever. A lot of it is dependent on languages. Uh, I'll give you an example. Nordic country, Switzerland, Denmark, they do not want to outsource to anything in, in, in Asia. Right, so I know that if I, I'm talking to somebody in, in, in the Nordic, like ABB, I'm not going to even go in there and propose a pricing model that is that has resources out of Manila, Philippines, or whatever it is. Right, I'm going to focus on you know Budapest, you know Bucharest, you know Krakow, the the Eastern European country, and then as a result, my pricing will be reflective of that. Does that? I'm gonna have to answer that one, right? Because because uh, uh, I feel like you're not satisfied yet. But I let me let me cover on that, and maybe we can talk about that. You, you know? yeah. Also, since you said that the breadth of the services that you guys offer ranges from uh, the sort of more payroll services to more strategic ones. So where where is the difference? Where's the line between outsourcing shared services and so, something like consulting? Maybe? Okay. Uh, so let, let me maybe begin. A shared services can be a captive or an outsource. A captive is when I build a shared services for my own organization, right? And typically, what happens is is that a company that is trying to get into shared services, they initially don't want to outsource something, right? And 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 a lot of times, to be honest, that's there's a lot of politics involved, right? Because people lose their job, so they want to go. Okay, well, we we start the process by just building something internally. Okay, and then, it, and for some companies, that's fine. They can build a captive share of services, and we've done it in you know, places like Ohio and Tennessee, and that's fine, and, and that works for them. Other companies, if they are not more aggressive on their cost driver, they just run out of business, right? So, so that's when the, sh the outsourcing conversation actually comes in, right? Because I can build share services for you in, um, in the US, and, but I can probably have the, the efficiency and everything through a 
probably reduce your OpEx by about 20, 30 percent. If, if you let me do the same project and let me leverage outsource capability, I can reduce your operating expenses by about 65 percent. So for a lot of companies, an issue of survival. So it sounds to me like Wipro is both a product as well as a service company. I'm just, because for example, selling the IT tool that will help an internal shared services mm -hmm. activity or so, I'm just wondering in your experience, is that an important combination to have for your consulting business? Right, for, for us, you have to have it, right? Well, what I mean by that is that I can go to the market and say, well, we provide services. The first thing a customer will ask is, okay, got it. What kind of tools do you guys use to actually drive more savings? And, and if I don't have a, that product angle, I typically lose out on, <laughs> on, on the conversation. So for us, it's, it's the two are, are, are yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reality is for us is that those tools are needed for us as well because the more we can leverage technology to create efficiency and effectiveness, the lower we can pass the cost down to a customer. That drives uh, the number of customers we have. I'm sorry. In this concept has, um, has been used in ADP, something like ADP. Mm -hmm. And what's your advantage compared with your competitive? With a company like ADP, well, for, for us, we you know we're we're competitor we're competitive with them, right? So the one thing that we don't do that ADP does is they do a lot of the the tax filing, right? So a company in the U.S. that wants to keep their local operation in the U.S. they're fine, but ADP doesn't really exist that from a footprint perspective in say Eastern Europe. Or, or South America and stuff like that. And so companies that are looking for more of a global present typically engage a company like Wipro. Oh, and by the way, I'm not trying to advertise Wipro, okay? Uh, there are a number of companies in this space, IBM, Accenture, Infosys, TCS. Uh, there's, a, there's probably about you know, 20 companies are in this space that are well known. So, but but the, saying that the operating model for the most part is the same. Any, any, go ahead. I'm curious about your example with uh, BMW because you're, like you mentioned, uh, BMW is not, was not so, um, wouldn't so care much about this cost. So I'm, I'm wondering what does BMW seeks from Wipro? Uh, so my experience with shared services, my customer always starts with cost and ends with cost. Right, right. And, and, and for the, in the past, when, when shared services was first developed, the cost play was, was, was significant, right? But nowadays, when you look at the, the, the market, you know, $3 trillion market, cost play is probably about 60% of that. The value play is probably the rest, right? The value in the, what I call compliance is, is makes up the other 40, right? So for example, with, with BMW, if you think about it, right, what is their mission? What, what do they want to do as an organization? Do they want to, do they want, want to be known as the company that makes the best in, uh, instrument cluster? Or do they want to be known as the company that makes the best performance car? Right? That's right. So, so the, the instrument cluster is kind of the necessary evil for them, right? Because you need that, right? So, but it's not why they're in business. And so for activities that are what I call non-core, those are candidates for, for, uh, for uh, Share services or outsourcing in this case. So I think still the company are um, doing their own benchmarking that if they develop this non core business themselves, what's the cost of this versus if they right. outsource Wipro? What's the cost yeah, yeah. So, so let me, uh, yeah, let, let, I, I apologize. Let, let me be clear on that. I could develop a, um, I can have two wires, okay? One wire for me is, let's say, it costs you know, $20 a foot long, okay? It's gold plated, it's, it's, it's highly accurate. And the other wires is kind of your standard wire. It cost me about, you know, I don't know, four bucks a foot. Okay, I have both of those. Awesome. The, what, I, what I was saying when, when it comes to being companies like BMW not being cost centric is that it's between the two models. They don't necessarily want me to actually use the cheapest of the two, right? They want me to make, make sure I manage my cost but they, they're asking for high-end component. That, that's what I meant. I, I apologize if, if, if I uh, said something else in that. 
Okay, um, I know I'm kind of rushing for time, so I'll just run through, through these uh, a little bit uh, real fast. So what, what I'm saying here is that you can standardize, you can do all of that stuff, you can build the best shared services center in the world. And this actually answers your question about technology, right? But at the end of the day, you need strong tool to actually drive business transformation, right? And so what I mean by this an example is if you're an organization and you run your whole financial system using Excel, which I love, by the way, I'm not knocking Excel, um, and, and you guys shouldn't either because your uh, work, right? School work and everything. But, and Excel is a great tool, but it is not a tool for you to run a financial system for a multi-billion dollar company. So you need to leverage you know, ERP capabilities to do that. So what I'm saying is that uh, automation and then enable, enablement will help you drive a significant amount of cost saving as well, in addition to just the standardization and, and consolidating your processing. Okay. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to this slide real quick, because I, I want to talk about global trends. So, so one of the things that we know is that shared service as, an, as a movement is moving eastward, right? This, this has happened for the past 20 years since I first got started in this market. We're actually moving eastward and downward. So, you know, there's movement towards, you know, um, India, China, the Philippines, um, and now within the past several years, I'm, I'm seeing movements towards like countries like Vietnam, Laos, um, uh, as well. So that's, that's that. And the other bit is that, you know, you're seeing movement down to South America. Right, Brazil, um, you know, Venezuela, Costa Rica, etc. Okay. So the the business case was shared. I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna actually go to this slide because you guys have the rest. You know, everything else kind of leads to this slide, and and because of the time, I want to go through this. Again, when you are talking about shared services organization, you're talking about reducing your opex anywhere from 30 to 60 percent. Right, and in some cases, significantly more than that. Um, a number of years ago, one of my clients was a company called Stewart Title, and if you're in the U.S. and you buy a house or whatever, chances are you use their uh, their products. Um, we were able to reduce the headcount of of Stewart Title, and we didn't outsource anything. We moved everything to Houston, but we reduced the FTE count from 475 employees down to 73. So. So think about the advantage from, from a market competitiveness perspective when you're able to save that much money and then you know, compete. And again, for them, it was not an outsourcing. They, they built everything in-house. Okay. Any, any questions on, on, on benefit case or anything like that? Okay. So the next piece I want to go through you guys real quick is, is this, uh, this whole concept, what I call, you know, the, where is shared services going, right? So what I, you know, this is where, this is, this is the area that I, that I am very focused on nowadays, which is what I call GBS, Global Business Services. And it's the idea of allowing shared services um, to, to help you drive uh, competitive behaviors, right? So, and, and here's why this is important. In the past, if you're, if you're a shared services organization, you collect a whole bunch of data through transaction processing, right? The question is, can you leverage those data can you leverage the data you collected to actually drive to, for, from a competitive perspective? Can you l look at product development and drive product development through data that you collect about your customer, right? Uh, materials, if I know a certain buy buying pattern through data that I've collected, can I use that to negotiate rates with the vendor when I buy some raw material? So that's, that's what I meant on that. And then, you know, my, my concept about you know, global business and services is that this is the new way, this is where this is exciting. This, in my mind, that $3 trillion market right now, um, about $500 billion of that is towards what I call GBS. And, and, and the reason is because most people are, are most organizations are still unsure about what the GBS market looks like and how, how does that work, right? So one of the things that I have, I have the opportunity to do in my job is I travel and talk to executive about how do, how, do we, how do we take shared services, which can be boring at time, and then flip it around and make it you know, a tool that you as an organization can leverage to drive competitiveness, right? whether it's market development, um, uh, product development, um, customer acquisition, customer retention, 
right? Any, any questions so far that, that we have on the, I don't know what the flicker is, but any questions so far at all? Okay. Okay, and here I just wanna share with you just a, a few example of companies that are moving towards the, the global business services model. Uh, Unilever and BP um, and, and uh, Best Buy are, are, are big clients of mine, and those are uh, accounts that I work on. Um, and then, but again, you can see like in the company like uh, Centrica, they are still in the whole mentality that we build share services for our finance function, and we're happy with that. We don't care about anything else. We just want to drive out as much cost as possible. And we only care about finance right now. We don't want to deal with HR. We don't want to deal with procurement. We don't want to deal with anything like that. Um, companies that are doing what I call multiple uh, functional share services, you can see the list there. But basically what they are is they're, they're, they're doing finance accounting as well as HR or IT. They add multiple functions in their back office. Okay, And then global share services, or companies like GSK is a big client of mine, and what, what they're doing is that they realize, okay, we are a global company. We can't just build one share services center to support everything, right? So for us, we're gonna build what we call regional share services. I'm gonna build one to, in Asia, right? I'm gonna build one in Latin America to support the Spanish language. I'm gonna build one in North America, right, to support everything else, the, the, um, you know, and then I'm gonna build some other what I call unique share services, for example, Russia. Doesn't, you can't find a whole lot of Russian speaking people outside of Russia for whatever reason. And so if you have a business model that operates in Russia, you typically build a share services center in Russia. Okay? I am going to jump through these. Through. Um, the, the, the next slide, you guys have this, so I don't want to go through this uh, too much, but basically what my point is that when you go through and you select where is it in the world that you want to build a share services organization, there's a number of criteria that you need to push through, right? And I just kind of share with you guys here some of the things that we as an organization deal with and some of the parameters that we look at when we work with our customer, okay? Um, and again, you know, when, once you kind of do the segmentation and you aggregate everything up, you determine what is the right location for you. Um, so, so here's here's the opportunity for um, Asia, right? So, like I share with you, India produce about 800,000 graduate a year. Okay, um, China is not even uh, China, the number in, in China is not even funny. It's I, I want to say like 3.2 million. Graduate a year. Seven million a year. Yeah, graduate. Seven million graduates a year. It, it, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The, what, what we consider qualified to do the work that we're talking about, I'm, I'm sorry. So the, from the business school, so we're not talking about just like the whole population, like liberal arts and everything else. So if you think about just the number of that, and you can have countries like uh, Vietnam that has, you know, um, uh, I forget what was the number, like, okay like 70 million people, and the literacy rate is like 98% or something like that. Uh, again, varies a few basis points, uh, a few percentage points from, from one study to another. But you just look at the opportunities, right? And you look at companies like in the, in the US and in Europe that are looking to move operation overseas. There's a lot of opportunity. The question is, how do we, as a group, you know, leverage that? So this next slide, and, that, and this is it for me. Um, so again, you know what? What I share with you guys is this: okay, um, the the next five or ten years, share services, global business services will drive a significant impact in Asia. The question then becomes: what is what do we do about it? Right? Do we do we help drive the business, or do we sit back and and let the business just happen? So. The, the challenge that I have as a practitioner in this space is that we lack a lot of talent. Uh, MBAs who are looking to kind of move into this area, because most people want to do stuff like investment banking, um, you know, the merger and acquisition stuff. What I'm saying to you guys, if there's an opportunity to look at this from a career perspective, you know, this might be something that you'll be interested in. Any other questions on that? Okay. All right.